Well, good morning, church. It has been a good morning so far, wouldn't you think? Just to, again, be able to come together and spend a little time studying God's Word together, singing songs of praise, praying together, observing the broken body of our Lord Jesus and why He did what He did, and giving back to Him. You know, it's Sunday mornings are where we pack a lot into a short period of time, but man, it's quality, isn't it? Quality when we can come and worship the one who is worthy of our very best, and that is our Lord Jesus. Today, as we sit around in the stool in the schoolroom here at these little desks looking up at the, the board, our master's gonna teach us today to fear not. Fear is something that consumes so many. And as we look through uh, the, the Bible, we see fear is used a lot of times in, in many different ways. The Greek word in the New Testament for fear is phobio. And where we get our English word, we use phobia. If you have a phobia of something, you have a what? A fear of something, right? Well, we want to kind of get a handle on our fear as Christians. Fear is almost like a snake that coils around its victim. And would you show that picture up there, J.D., I had earlier? I know a lot of you squeamish on snakes. But the snake will use a technique called constriction. It will coil around its prey, and as its prey breathes out, it will squeeze even tighter so that the lungs cannot expand and eventually its prey succumbs to suffocation. Fear is the same way with us. Picture us being that little deer or antelope right there and the fear that Satan brings into our life being that snake that's coiled around us. If we live a life in fear, every time we exhale, the coils of that fear will grow tighter and eventually, we will succumb. We will no longer have life that's truly life. We will have a shadow of what type of life we should live in Christ. And so I want us to look at what the Scripture has to say. We realize in the New Testament there are much teaching on how we should view fear. As Paul was writing to young Timothy and teaching Timothy how to lead the congregations. He tells him in that second letter, chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. From the very beginning in the New Testament, as we read about the life of Jesus, we see that, that God did not want the righteous to live in fear. You think about all of the the nativity scene that we see lived out. You, you think about when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant and he was, he was afraid, he was, he was embarrassed. He, he, didn't, he didn't want harm to come to her, but he was in a predicament. The angel appeared to Joseph and said, don't be afraid. When Zacharias was, was in the temple, he was growing older and, and the Holy Spirit had confirmed to him that he would live long enough to see the Messiah, but the night was coming upon him. The end of his life was near and he was afraid. The angel appeared to Zacharias and said, don't be afraid. You will see the promised one. When Mary, that young maiden, was was. Over, overcome by the spirit. She had a spirit of fear within her, but the angel appeared and says, don't be afraid, Mary. The shepherds who were out in the, in the fields keeping watch over the flocks at night when the sky lit up and the angelic host commenced the singing, what they were told was, don't be afraid. The master does not want us to live a life of fear. Fear keeps us from godly peace. And last week, we looked at this, this arithmetic of addition, and Jesus asked us to add something to our life. What was it? His yoke. Add my yoke upon you. 
Learn from me. And he says that my yoke is easy. And we learned last week that easy does not mean effortless, right? The walk with Christ is not effortless. It takes effort. But easy was just right. Here, we see that fear is not an absence of danger. Danger is all around us. The people in the first century church, they had danger every time they ventured out of their house. It was danger around them. So the fear is not, not an absence of danger, but an existence of faith and trust. Now, faith and trust, friends, helps us to resist fear. And if we can, in faith, walk our life and trust that God is going to see us to the other side, just like he promised us, through Christ, then that faith and that, that uh, trust that we have helps us to master fear, to no longer, no longer live a life hiding, but to be able to master fear, not, not to live in an existence absence of it, but we have to put a handle on it and master it. So the opposite of fear is faith. So when we think about fear, let's, let's understand that we need to know what the opposite of fear is. We live our life in fear, let's stop that. It's going to be difficult because danger's everywhere and the realization of that and the dread of it, the, the terror of it, what fear is, dread and terror of something that hadn't happened yet, that fear can paralyze us. But let's not live a life of fear. Let's live a life of faith and trust. Another meaning in the word fear is something that we should understand. Fear is not just terror and dread. Fear, as used in our Bible, is also to reverence, to respect, to admire, to adore, and to worship God. That's where many of you, when you hear the word fear, you may go back to that Old Testament passage in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We, we hear that and we say, oh, we need, to, we need to run and hide from the Lord. That's not the way God is portrayed through the life of Jesus, is it? To run and hide from him? No. He says, come. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word from Jesus is fear not. To come to him, to reverence him, to love him. Jesus heals a paralyzed man in the New Testament. And we see that those around him, when they saw that event happen, it says, when the multitude saw it, they were afraid. They had fear, but it was a, a reverent fear because of what it says next, and glorified God who had given such power to men. You see, there is an opposite of dread and terror. And that opposite is to reverence and to worship. Now, the passage I want us to look at today is found in the Gospel of Matthew. This time, it's going to be in Matthew chapter 10. If you wouldn't mind, turn to that text, if you would. Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 27, and we'll go to verse 31. In the context of what is happening, Jesus is sending out his disciples, his students, out to do ministry. To go out into the highways and byways and teach the good news, the gospel, and to prepare people to meet God. And so they were, they were under this, this um, command as he is giving them this instruction. And let's start reading in verse 27. Jesus says, whatever I teach you in the dark, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. These disciples were going into hostile territory. 
They were going behind enemy lines. Satan had a stronghold on this area of Judea and Palestine. And the people were rejecting Jesus' teaching in many cases. And so with that rejection came persecution. Their very lives were put on the line. But Jesus says, do not fear what man can do to you. You may be hated by someone. You may be in danger from someone. But all they can do is hurt this old temporal house that you live in, this body. And we don't want that to happen to any of us, do we? None of us want our bodies subjected to pain and discomfort or agony. But Jesus said, the world hates me, they're going to hate you even more. The message that I'm preaching, they're trying to kill me for it. But I want you to shout it from the housetops. And don't fear them who are seeking to hurt you. Who their only power is to destroy the home that you live in. You've got an everlasting soul. You have got something that's not going to perish when you breathe your last breath in this life. And so he says, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So friends, we've asked you time and time and time again to take the message of Jesus out into your workplaces into your neighborhoods, to share the hope that you have of Jesus to those that you're familiar with. And I know it's not being done. Oh, sure, you may invite them to come to church, and that's wonderful. We appreciate that. But much more than inviting them to come to a corporate worship service, which they may not even understand, why don't you tell them about what Jesus means to you? The hope that he brings to your life, the difference that you have seen in your life since you started following him. Why not share Jesus with someone? The reason why most of us do not do that is not because of our workplace rules. It's not because we don't have enough time. It is because we are afraid. We are afraid to share him with others. We are afraid that we might be rejected. No one likes to be rejected, do they? None of us like rejection. But weigh it on a scale, making Jesus pleased that we shared him and what he means to us with others, as opposed to the one who might say, yeah, that's okay for you, but no thank you. Which one is the 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 greater blessing sharing Jesus or being rejected it's a no-brainer isn't it we know that right here on Sunday morning at 11 15 we know that's the case but what's going to happen at 12 o'clock what's going to happen tomorrow morning at 8 30 that my friends is what makes a difference it's not enough just to put on your Christian attire and act righteous once or twice a week. That's not following Jesus. That's not learning from the master. Jesus wants to encourage and empower you. And so he tells us today, fear not those who can harm the body, and that's all that they've got to offer. Rather, you better respect the one who after the body's destroyed, he can cast your soul into torment. Friends, that's a scary thought. We don't like to talk about that part, do we? We, we like to talk about love, like to talk about mercy and grace, but the reality of it is that there is an accountability that we all have. And if we do not, do not grasp hold to that life that is truly life, and we leave this world without Jesus, there's not gonna be any hope for us. 
So Jesus teaches us, fear not. Subtract fear out of your daily life. Again, friends, it's not the absence of danger. Danger's everywhere. I can stand up here now with confidence saying, you know, I'm, I'm tough, I'm strong, I'm, I'm, I'm able to handle the things of this world. But you let a little house mouse crawl up my pants leg <laughs> and get above my knee and you're going to see a man who's in fear. I'm going to be shaking. I'm gonna, danger is out there, right? But we need to not be afraid of the things that Jesus said, I've already conquered that. I'm in control of that. Rather, we need to put great respect, great admiration, adoration, worship into the one who controls our eternity. And so that's what Jesus wants us to see. And he goes on and he tells them something that's practical for them. Let's read verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Are not two sparrows sold for, let's just say in our terms, a penny? Now, let me ask you a, a personal question. If you were to go to a restaurant here in just a few minutes and you open up your car door and you're walking across the parking lot and on the ground is a, a picture or a, a coin that's got a picture of Abraham Lincoln on it, how much is that value? A penny. Would you even stop to reach down and pick it up? Some of you would, some of you wouldn't. Some of y'all heathens are saying, only if it's on heads. Um, <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, seriously, a lot of people today would just walk right over a penny. It's not worth it. Dan, would you reach down and pick up a penny? Not because it's valuable. Dan wouldn't pick it up because he's wondering if that guy had a germ on it when he dropped it. <laughs> He'd sanitize that thing when he got home. But no, seriously, a penny's not of much value, right? Seriously, a penny used to get you a little, one of those little square pieces of chewing gum. You can't even find one of them anymore for a penny. But Jesus says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? In other words, they're not worth much in the world, but what? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. He's watching the sparrows. And he goes on and he says, <laughs> I, I think this is awesome. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Jesus is saying that God is watching over the birds of the air and he cares enough to know how many hairs are on your head. Now, this morning, out of all that's in this attendance today, probably my wife Sandy loves me the most. I'd say so. I hope so. Okay? <laughs> Might be a close, close battle, uh, I don't know, but Sandy, how many hairs are on my head? Not many, she says. <laughs> All right. You can count on her to be truthful. But the answer is she doesn't know. Absolutely, it's a lot less than it was back in 1987 when we started dating. But she don't know how many hairs are on my head. And she loves me so much more than any of you jokers. But you know, God loves me more than her. He knows how many hairs are up there. He cares about us. That's why Jesus doesn't want us to run around being fearful, being afraid. Don't let that serpent coil around you and take the life out of you. Jesus wants us to know how much God cares for us. Verse 31, do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Ah, oh, man, I love that. I love that thought. Now again, Jesus is sending his disciples out into the, into the, the wolves' lair, and he's preparing them. And he says, go with confidence because God is going to watch over you. He's going to take care of you. Nothing's going to happen apart from his will in your life. So, the application for them was to go with boldness and confidence. The application is the same for us in this life. We're on a mission as well, aren't we? The Great Commission was not just for those 
in that uh, group that was his disciples. It was for all of his disciples, past, present, and future. And that commission is to go into all the world and make disciples. And so we're called to not let fear hold us back from that. I love that concept of the little sparrows too. You know, it's, that's beautiful. When we, when we have snow on the ground, many of us will take out bird seed and we'll cast it out so the little birds have something to eat. And we, we see the sparrows by the dozens come in and they start collecting that seed. We, we give them a little something to eat. I don't want you to ever, after this point in your walk with the Lord, ever see a sparrow without thinking about Jesus' words. God cares what's going on to that sparrow. God cares what's going on with you. So when you see that sparrow, let it be a reminder for you. Maybe that's why Jesus told those disciples about this, this sparrow uh, being so, so important to the Lord. They were going to go out on this journey. Maybe, maybe when times got tough for them, maybe when fear started to coil around them, they would see a sparrow and they would be reminded, ah, thank you, Lord, you're watching. You're watching me. Man, that's powerful, powerful. Up at uh, Don Brown's house, uh, we, we go up there for gatherings and there's a little, little picture frame that he and Justine have up in their house. It's got this, this uh, little poem written by Elizabeth Cheney. It's called The Robin and the Sparrow. Listen to this. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so said the sparrow to the robin. Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Man, I'm telling you, that hits close to home, doesn't it? The sparrows, the little birds of the air know that God's going to take care of them. And we don't. Man, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? God cares for you. And I want us to stop living a life of, of fear. We should, we should want to be in his presence. We should want to be around him. He desires that from us. Jesus, when he said, fear not those who can only harm the body, and after that, they're done. They can't do anymore. But rather fear him who after the body's destroyed can cast the soul into torment. He's wanting us to know how powerful God is, how he should be worshiped and admired, and he wants us to want to be around him. He desires for that. We can go all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve, where they were naked and unashamed. They had no shame. Why? Because they had no fear. That's the way God intended it, and it'll be like that again one day, my friends. One day we will be in his presence and not have fear. In this life, there's going to be danger all around us, but let's not live in such a way that we show those around us that we're uncertain of who our Lord is. Let's not live our life in such a way that we show the world around us we don't trust our God. It is so easy to trust him when everything's going great, isn't it? When you're healthy, when the automobiles are working, when there's money left over at the end of the month after the bills are paid, when you and your family are getting along great, boy, it's so easy to say, oh, I love you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. But then let all of those things start to crumble. Then that's whether you really trust him or not. Whether you really have faith in him or not. So don't let faith I mean, don't let fear rob you of your faith. Don't let fear rob you of your trust. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet in the 41st chapter, God is speaking through him. Isaiah is just a vessel, just a mouthpiece for God to tell his people what he wants them to hear. But listen to these words. And again, they were, they were for the nation back in that day, but they're for us 
who are the followers of Christ the same today. Isaiah 41 verse 9 through 10, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't run around in confusion. Trust me, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friends, God's word is true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants us to cast away fear. Subtract that out of our life because then blessings will start to flow. John records for us the words of Jesus in that 14th chapter, the last night that Jesus was on earth before the crucifixion when all of those disciples would, would be put to the test and to be honest with you, would fail the test. He still wanted to teach them. In that upper room discord, we read these words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Hear those words of the master teacher today. Mark records for us Jesus' words at the death of Jairus' daughter. I can't think of anything more of a trial than to lose a child. Jairus had, was a ruler of one of the synagogues and he came to Jesus and he said, Master, please come, my, my daughter's sick unto death. Come and, and you can heal her. But before Jesus can ever start toward Jairus' house, Jairus' servants came and said, don't worry the master, your daughter's dead. Man, can you imagine what that would feel like? How that would crush your soul? You can just see the fear just sucking the life out of that father. But listen to the words of Jesus, do not be afraid, only believe. Those words hold true for us today. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And in closing, I want to share a passage of Scripture we studied not that long ago when we was looking at the book of the Revelation. In that first chapter, John is recording what he, what he witnessed. And I want to read these words to you. Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him... I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. You see, Isaiah prophesied that God would uphold us with his magnificent and righteous right hand. Jesus puts his right hand upon John and lifts him up and he says, don't be afraid. I have overcome death. I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of hell and death and I'm giving you victory. Man, that word is for you and I today. He is giving you victory. If you've accepted him and you walk in that newness of life, he's given you victory. No longer do we have to be afraid of dying. No longer do we have to be afraid of the unknown future. Take courage. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe in him, church. Trust in him. For those of you who are not in Christ, I want you to believe, but you've got to follow that up. That faith in Him is an action word and it leads to the confession of Him, the repenting of your sins, the baptism into His holy name for the forgiveness of sin and the indwelling of His Spirit. Man, that's available to you today. It's available. And all you've got to do is say yes, Lord, and come to Him. We can go to the foot of the cross at Calvary 
You can lay that lifetime full of sin down and you can rise up out of that watery grave of baptism, a new creation. It's available to you today. But will you take it? Friends, at the end of this journey, it's not about knowing who Jesus is. It's about did you know him as your Savior? There's a lot of people out there in the world who've heard of Jesus. They know about him. But they don't follow him. I want you to follow him today. Whatever decision you have on your heart, as we stand and sing this final song, would you make that decision today? Would you come and give your life to him? If you, if you just need to draw closer to him, come and, and spend some time in prayer. If you're carrying those burdens of life, lay them down today. Whatever it is, make that decision.